I'm John Vandeventer. I'm the author of the Relic series uh, and uh, another series for young adults called Shadow Chasers. The Relic series is about Sasquatch. You know, he, it's in all three books. Shadow Chasers, I'm kind of jumping around with other cryptids. Okay. And how much research did you do for these books um, on Bigfoot? A lot. A lot. Um Originally, how this how this started, an old friend of mine wanted me to do a uh, a novel. I don't know why he chose me because I, I never planned on writing books or anything else. But uh, he had a uh, small production company made those thirty minute infomercials, and he was into Bigfoot big time. And he asked me if I would help him by writing this novel, and he was going to do something with it, like make make a short film out of it. I didn't want to, but I agreed. I, I knew nothing about Sasquatch, nothing. And then, um, so he was giving me information. I started writing, and then he told me a couple of weeks later, he had a lead project. He had some big happening for him out in California. So he did that, and I was kind of relieved. And I had printed out some of the uh, material I, I had uh, written, and my older sister happened to be in visiting from Arkansas, saw the printout and said, oh, you got to finish this. You got to make this novel. And I'm like, no, I really don't want to because I'm not familiar <laughs> with Bigfoot. So she talked me into it. So I dove in into research. Um, at the time, I was a copier tech, and I was driving anywhere to 150, 300 miles a day. So I had a lot of road time, and I started listening to a lot of podcasts and any other information I could find. And then I started going and I started looking for areas where there was Bigfoot activity. I, I'd always been convinced it was West Coast only. That That's how little I knew of it. And I'll tell you how little I knew of it. I remember as a kid seeing the movie uh, uh, Legend of Boggy Creek. And until I started researching, I never associated Legend of Boggy, Boggy Creek with Bigfoot. Um, I'd seen it a couple of times as a kid, thought nothing else of it. So I saw where there was a lot of activity in Southeast Oklahoma. So I decided to uh, use this area for my, for my setting because I live fairly close to it, you know, uh, about a little more than two and a half hours away. And I just became fascinated with the subject. And about the same time I started uh, researching Bigfoot, one of the first things I did was buy two books, um, The Hoopa Project and Tribal Bigfoot that David Politis had written. I came across as missing 411 stuff. So Sasquatch and missing 411 kind of had a cool vibe where they could go together. So I started out using it. And then, um, like I said, I just became fascinated. I started looking around the salt, North Sulphur River area of Texas. Uh, went to research an area with some other people in um, Arkansas, Brown Springs, north of Russellville, Arkansas. Uh, then I came up here. I've been writing a book about six months and had never come up here. I was just using Google Earth to describe the terrain. And one day I thought, well, I'm going to go up to Oklahoma and take a look around. So I came up going to Tallahena, which is a setting for the first book. And I came through Honubi and I'd heard about the siege of Honubi. And this area was just beautiful. Fell in love with it. Um, really got into the research, started doing a little research here around Honubi and Brown Springs, Arkansas, or Brown Springs, Oklahoma, another area is supposed to be really active. And then um, in 2018, early 2018, our company, the company I was working for, we picked up all the Choctaw um, casino contracts for their printing and faxing and all that. And I was, and I, that's what I did. I was tech. And we were, you know, coming up here to do repairs and it was getting home real late. And I heard the president and the service manager were looking for somebody in Oklahoma. So I just walked in and volunteered to move up here, which we did. And we moved here in May of 2018. We've been here five years now, as a matter of fact, and just love it. So when you went out um, in the the first initial points of going out to, you know, the rivers and, and looking at, did anything happen? Did you, did you see any evidence? Did you, how, how deep did you get in the woods and how much, how much were, were boots, boot on the ground kind of thing? Well, it, early on, it was a lot, but um, not that many trips, but it was camping over the weekend and spending the whole weekend out looking. Now 
I didn't know what to look for. Mainly, I was looking for habitat. Um, when we went to Russellville, Arkansas, I took two of my sons with me, and we met some other people up there I'd been introduced to over the Internet. And um, it, it was kind of funny because I told my youngest son, we were looking at a sandbar along this creek, and I said, I don't know, if I was a Bigfoot, I'd come out on that sandbar at night, you know, and that's where I'd come to the water. And funny thing, a couple hours later, my son and I were first across the creek and we went left to where that sandbar was. And it took us about 20 minutes to get down to the sandbar. And my son said, what is this? And it was this weird looking footprint. I mean, and it was right on the sandbar I had mentioned. So that was kind of neat. And uh, so, yeah, I kind of got the bug then and started going out more in the areas, like I, I said. And then um, the writing took up most of my time. It took me two and a half years to write the book. And I, you know, I got to the point where, okay, I better quit messing around out in the woods if I want to get this book written, you know, I'm going to have to stay in and write. But um, funny thing, after we moved up here, um, the space place is supposed to be a Bigfoot hotspot, you know. <laughs> but I remember in Brown Springs, it had kind of a creepy air to it. Um, it just felt uncomfortable. And I never got that feeling here in Honubi. So as I got the book written um, and we moved up here and the book was had just been published, I went to Brown Springs again and it was August of uh, 2018. And, you know, it, there was just nothing. And I remember I was I was kind of disappointed. I was coming back home and full of uh tick bites and sugar bites you know it, it was terrible I was miserable and when I got home I, I told my wife I said you know I think there may be Bigfoot or something similar at Brown Springs because the area just gives me the creeps I said I don't think there's anything here there may have been at one time but there's not anymore and I don't think there's anything at Brown Springs and then two days later I had this sighting and, and it was ridiculous because I just, you know, had this profound um, um, hypothesis that there was no Bigfoot here. And uh, I had walked out. It was Tuesday night and I'd walked outside. And, and I don't know if people may recall in the summer of 2018, Mars was very prominent. And if I was ever going to be interested in anything paranormal, it was UFOs. I, I love the subject, I think, because I've always been a military aircraft um, freak. I mean, even as a little kid, you know, I, I tore pictures out of encyclopedias and hid them under my bed. So I think those two kind of went hand in hand. The UFO phenomenon in interests me. So I walked outside. I was looking at Mars. I walked around my wife's car. And when I did, I set off motion detector. Now we have five acres here in Hanobi, four that, you know, house is on. There's about three more behind us. And then we got one little acre across the street. It borders the Choctaw Cemetery. And so I was looking south that direction at Mars. And when the light went off, my eyes caught movement. And I looked down. And it, as soon as I saw this thing, I knew it wasn't human. And I knew it had to be something else. And I saw this bipedal figure. And it, it was running right along my property line, right next to the churchyard. And it was silhouetted perfectly because the churchyard has vapor lights in the background. That, that was about the only light out here at the time. And I watched it for a good four seconds run from my left to my right. And it, I went out the next day and measured it. And it was 100 yards. And he had to get it in five seconds, maybe a little less. I'd never seen anything move that fast. And the thing that struck me and the thing that made me convinced it was not a man was not only the speed, but it didn't swing its arms. It, it held its arms kind of like in a surfer stance. And the only time I saw it pump its arms was at the very end of the siding when it left. And I assumed it was leaping over a fence over there because I'd never really walked in that part of the property yet because it was so thick. But the next morning I went out there and actually where I lost sight of the creature where it leaped, there was a pile of old logs and rocks that the people had piled up there right along the property line clearing area there for the churchyard. So I run into the house, you know, and I'm, I'm telling my wife, Monica, Monica, I, I, I just saw Sasquatch. She looks me in the eyes and says, Oh, John, and then three months later, she had a sighting, same area. It, the thing was going the opposite direction. And uh, luckily, there was two other people with her that saw it. So I didn't get the old Monica moment. I didn't get to return a favor. There, you know, there was three 
three witnesses on this one. Now, I have a, a neighbor that lives over across the road from me there. And I saw where I saw it going. It was heading into his property. So I asked him a couple of months later about it. And he's a Choctaw gentleman. Um, and uh, he said he believes and he says, oh, yeah, yeah, I've, I've seen him back there before. There's a there's a nature trail back there, an animal trail, you know, deer and stuff. I mean, there's deer everywhere. You know, we're, you can almost walk out my door and hand feed them if you want. But um, so he believed. Now, one thing I will say, we have a we have a Bigfoot festival here every year. And um, some of the folks in the area believe and some don't. Um, some are some are uh, adamant about there's nothing out there. They've lived here their whole lives, you know, and they may be in their 60s and 70s and never seen a thing. And then there's people say, oh, yeah, I've seen them. So. I don't know why some people see them, some don't. I, I think it's like lightning. You have to be, you have to be in the uh, right position at the right time to see it. Um, I will say, when something weird has ever happened to me in my life, it wasn't because I was out looking for it. It was because I was doing something else, and that was exactly the case with my sighting. I wasn't even thinking about Bigfoot. I was thinking about Mars, and um, bang, it happened. Just totally by accident. That is kind of yeah, an interesting yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. If I hadn't, if I hadn't walked out, I'd probably be sitting here telling you I still hadn't seen one. So. Exactly. Um, so, what do you think they are? Well, that's that's a good question. And um, if I had to base it on all I saw and what I witnessed with my own eyes, um, I would say it was an animal. But I'm not convinced of that because of people I've talked to and interviewed and um, my wife found a track here about four miles from our house. And it was one of those things where it was just one track. There should have been more, but it was just one track. Now, granted where it was, the ground was a little softer and close to a Creek. So it was, it was better for making tracks, but there should have been one or two other ones. And there wasn't um, the reason my sister had pushed so hard for me to write the book. I didn't know this, but, she she passed away a couple of years ago, but they uh they lived in what they lived in White County, Arkansas. Her husband still lives there, my brother in law, and they'd had activity around their house and never told anybody for years. And one one of the weirdest things that happened to her was she was home. Um, you know this wasn't but maybe twenty years ago, and she had her grandchildren with her, two of her granddaughters, and they were making cookies, and it was snowing outside, and they were one of the few people who lived on this mountain. Well, she, she was looking out the front window and she could see footprints and she didn't go out because she was scared. And she said, uh, it looked like a human had walked through there though, but I couldn't tell I didn't go outside. So she got creeped out, closed the curtains and, um, you know, just spent her time with her granddaughters. And my, my brother-in-law worked at the, uh, worked for Missouri Pacific railroad in North Little Rock. Well, he got home about one o'clock and he saw the tracks. He grabbed a flashlight and a gun and he wasn't real sure what they were. And he followed the tracks and they went from her front yard around their house to the back window above the kitchen sink. And it's 10 feet from the ground to that window when you're outside. And the tracks ended there. Um, there was no backtracking. There was no jumping to the side. There was no tree somebody or something could have grabbed and lifted themselves up they just ended there at the window as if the thing was looking in the window and then just went away so um and i you know i i trust my sister and my brother-in-law because you know they had never said anything like that before told any wild stories before uh a funny thing when um just before the first book went out I started dating my wife and it took a while. It took like four months to get a date with her. And I always think this is kind of humorous. So I was taking her to Texarkana. We lived in Sulphur Springs, Texas at the time. And uh, she was asking me, so tell me about this book you're writing. And it taken me so long to get a date with her. I didn't want to tell her I'm writing a book about Bigfoot, fiction, nonfiction, whatever, you know, and I just really didn't want to talk about it because I'd taken a lot of heat at work. You know, people found out what I was writing and, you know, you know, you just, you get teased. So I wasn't in a big hurry to tell her. Finally, I, I told her and I said, but it's just a novel and it's set in Oklahoma. And I told her and she just kind of nodded her head and said, well, you know, um, I've always thought 
if those things are real, there's some some type of Nephilim or have something to do with Nephilim um, DNA, a different DNA. And I was like, and I'd never read the Bible at the time. I was like, what's a Nephilim? And she said, you you haven't read the Bible. And I said, no. She goes, well, you should. And start at Genesis 6, you know, for, for this. But, you know, she was intent on me reading the whole Bible. So I kind of went that direction, looking at it and looking into other things like that. I liked uh, listening to David Politis. Um, then I started listening to, uh, along with David Politis, uh, L.A. Marzulli and some other people. Now, L.A. Marzulli. It's more of a UFO guy, but he touches on the Bigfoot phenomenon. And um, I'm kind of going to those, along those lines. I think it's it's a hybrid of some type. I mean, if you look at the uh, if you look at the uh, fossil record, there's really nothing for it. I know everybody talks about Gigantopithecus, but you know they're basing all that on a piece of jawbone and. Um, the way the uh, First Nations people have names for it, you know, so many tribes, like even the Choctaw tribe, and I live here in the Choctaw Nation now, is Champe or Oklachita. Champe is more of a, uh, like a, a monstrous, shadowy kind of figure, but some use that word for, for the Bigfoot. Or Oklachita, which just means big people, that's another uh, Choctaw term for them. So when you take that into account and all the other tribes and their, their, uh, vocal narratives or um you know tribal stories it's uh it starts making you think there's something out there plus you know you start looking at things going on in russia and so many witnesses nobody nobody has anything to gain by reporting a bigfoot sighting so why would they i mean to be honest when i saw mine i i made a statement on big on facebook i'd written a little thing on facebook i was in a bigfoot group and I was saying, guys, I saw this thing, and I didn't know it, but Wes Germer of uh, of uh, Sasquatch Chronicles fame was on there. Pardon me, need to wet the whistle here. And he asked me to come on his show. Well, I didn't want to. I was scared to death. I'd never done a podcast or anything like it. And, you know, I told him, I said, Wes, it really wasn't a scary sighting. I said, the thing was just running from my left to my right, lasted five seconds. Um it, there's, it's really not anything would be interesting for your for your uh, listeners because you know Sasquatch Chronicles is usually these really involved stories, but I went on anyway, and then it occurred to me, you know, I was trying to sell books, and I thought, you know what, I don't want to do this. I'm not going to speak of this anymore because people are going to just say, oh well, you're just trying to sell books. Well, they're absolutely right. I am trying to sell books. I mean, now that's what I do for a living. So yes, I want to sell books. And I'd gotten a little heat from a couple of people I'd told about it. And I just didn't want to, I didn't want to go through it. Um, I've actually, um, I'm actually friends with one of the guys that was involved in the, uh, the siege of Hanobi story. And I approached him a couple of years ago, wanting to know, Hey, do you want to write, no, would you like to write a book about what really happened and clear the air and everything? And he was absolutely adamant to know if I ever write some, I'm going to do it myself. And he's angry because he said, you know, um, a lot of those people are making a lot of money on that Bigfoot festival. And when we had our incident there during the siege of Hanobi is what he speaks of. He said, um, people laughed at me. People turned on me. And he goes, now they're all making a buck off me and my brother. And he goes, and. I just, he, he's very angry about it. So that convinced me. He's like, man, I don't want to speak of this stuff ever. And I didn't speak of my sighting for, for two years, I believe, two and a half years. Finally, I just said, you know what? I'm in this now. I'm just going to let it out. And I started speaking of it publicly. Any kind of other unusual things happen? You know, a lot of people talk about, you know, these glowing lights and orbs and sometimes craft around these things. Anything unusual like that down in that area? Yes, there is. Um, it, it, it's funny. It's like I didn't believe in any of this stuff until, uh, you know, I may have been interested in UFOs, but never believed in them until it's funny. It's like I met my wife. I started reading the Bible and some other uh, things like Book of Enoch. And all of a sudden, I don't know if I came more aware or what or if something's just, you know, if 
if God's opened my eyes or, you know, the, the cosmos is playing a joke on me. Um, I've had a, I've had a sighting of, of a UFO here. Now I've had a couple of UFO sightings in my life, but that's because I'm always looking up at the sky. And as an, you know, I'm a 16 year air force veteran. I've always been an aircraft freak. So I know what airplanes look like at night. So when I've had, I had the sighting here, I knew it wasn't an airplane and the only reason I called MUFON and reported it was because uh, because it w- there was a uh, meteor shower that night. And I'm thinking, man, if this thing was a meteor, it had to hit the ground. And it was going like different and moving much slower than the uh, meteors I was seeing that night. But, I, but here's the weird thing. I was standing at the same spot I was standing when I had the uh, Sasquatch sighting. And I'm looking for meteors. And I see this big orange football. And it and it's moving much slower than, the, you know, the meteors are moving. In fact, it was mo- moving no faster than, say, a jet aircraft. Um, I would think it, I would think it was below 10,000 feet and it was heading south, southeast toward Broken Bow. And like I said, the meteors were kind of yellowish um, green. And this thing was orange and it didn't leave a trail. And I saw it for about three or four seconds until. It went behind the mountain range to my south here, and, you know, I lost it behind that. So I called MUFON and reported it because I did not see anything on the news about a meteor hitting the ground or something. But this thing seemed so low that it had to impact the ground. Plus, Linda, it's hard to describe, but it seemed to be moving with intent. Now, I can't say it it adjusted its course or anything, but it just seemed... You know, it seemed to me like it had a little bit, like there was some intent in the direction it was going. So that's why I uh, I uh, reported it. And um, so I called MUFON a few days later. Um, a lady, real nice lady called me. I had called them and I filled out a statement on, on the Internet at their website. And she she told me, OK, here's the air traffic that was in the area that night. Could it have been that? And. The only thing it, I could have mistaken it for was an Airbus that was would have been to my back. It would have been north of me. I was facing south. So, and you know, I I told her I said, look, you know, um, sixteen year Air Force bet. We were doing night flying constantly. You know, I'm always looking. I, this was no airplane. So, I that was August 2021, and um. They just put it down as un- unknown on their records. And so I saw that. And then another night I was, uh, well, it actually was early in the morning. A few months after that, I was about to go to work and it was still dark outside. And I went out to warm the car up and I was, and it's a weird, the weirdest thing is this, it's like everything happens when I'm standing in this one spot. So I get to the gate and I'm looking up at the mountains. Um, and I think it was turkey season deer season anyway it was hunting season i'm looking at the mountains to the south now honubi we're in a little valley it's only a mile wide i got mountains in the north mountains to the south and our property kind of almost backs up the mountains to the north so i'm looking a good you know mile away at these uh these lights i'm seeing it and they're going along the mountain and i thought it maybe was hunters on four wheelers or atvs or something it was two single lights one following the other there were no red tail lights or anything and then just all of a sudden it dropped. The first one dropped, then the second one dropped like they went off a cliff. I thought, oh my goodness, you know, the guy didn't see it, went off a cliff. And and then they continued from my left to right along, you know, in that mountain area. And then they went back up and then they went on. It was like the lights got lost in the tree. So I have no idea what that was. It, had it been somebody on a uh, four wheeler or something, they would have killed themselves. Plus the light would have tumbled would have lost sight of it as it dropped at 200 feet or so. The orange light, uh, were there any animal mutilations or anything like that in that neighborhood at, around that? No, um, no, I never heard of anything like that. In fact, I never heard of of anything else um, to do with it. They just filed the report as an unknown. And, uh, and the lady, you know, she went on to talk to me about other things and, um, but no, I haven't heard of any cattle mutilations up here. Now, funny thing, I was just on a uh, podcast a couple of weeks ago about cattle mutilations down in Texas. Um, I don't know if you'd heard of them recently. There were six of them, but no, have not heard of any cattle mutilations up here. Sometimes the Pardon orange me? lights associated with animal mutilations. That's why I asked. 
Oh, is that right? Well, see, there's some enlightenment for me. I had no no real idea that the color of the UFO had anything to do with cattle mutilations, but that's interesting. Um, the uh, the lady that took the report, you know, she was pressing me for other things and uh, kind of a funny story. There's an elderly couple live here and uh, we would have lunch with them sometimes in a little store here. <laughs> the guy would be telling me this Bigfoot story he had that he said he was about 12 and they lived maybe a mile and a half from here and he had a pretty big family. Well, the father left. He just left the family and went on, you know, to whatever. I don't think he ever saw his father again. And uh, he was telling the story how they needed food. And, you know, his mom, they had an old gun, a shotgun, I believe, and said, you've got to go get us a deer or something. So he went up the mountain here in the north, he, and he's trying to find a deer or turkey, anything, you know, so they can feed the family. And he said, one of them monsters started following me. And he goes, you know, every now and then, I don't know what it was reflecting off of, but he said I would get some red reflections of his eyes and it followed me up the mountain. And I said, well, I'm not doing this. I'm going back down to the, uh, to, to the house. And I never really got to hear the end of the story because every time he started talking about this, his wife, who's also from the area, was adamant. She's like, oh, well, there ain't no Bigfoot. I've lived here my whole life and never seen a Bigfoot. And every time he'd tell me this story, she would interrupt him, and I'd never get to hear the end of it. So the last time he was telling me the story, I, she started, and I was just about to just ask her, please let him finish the story. I want to hear the end. And she did the same thing. Oh, there ain't no such thing as Bigfoot, blah, blah, blah. And then she goes, but you know what? We did see a flying saucer one night between here and Tallahena. And I don't know. I just found it humorous that his paranormal event didn't happen, but hers did. So, <laughs> you know, it's just... Uh, it was just humorous to me how, okay, so your flying saucer is okay, but his big foot isn't. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so the uh, that or orange light, that event was the only real orb or UFO kind of activity around Bigfoot that you've you've had, right? Right. That and the two little, you know, two little lights in the mountains. I, I think those yes. were more orb-like. Um, the UFO was a UFO. I think this thing was huge, whatever it was. I mean, I, I would think it would have been a big, as big as a bus. But again, I, you know, it was night. It was just like a big orange football. And I only saw it for a few seconds and went behind the mountains. Um, it, it's interesting. I found a uh, photograph that looks just like what I saw in the last couple of years. And um, it's also over a mountain and it's kind of pine trees in the background and i thought my goodness if that's exactly what i saw i couldn't ask for any better example so what else uh can you tell me about your experiences your research anything else that uh you know kind of the the emphasis that that all of this spoke to you um in writing your books well um i like I, after i had my sighting this is just going to sound silly after i had my sighting i just really quit going out and looking um, for one thing. And it's not, it had nothing to do with being scared or anything. I'm still in the same house. I'll walk down the street in the middle of the night if I want, you know, um, not scared. It was just like, okay, they're there. And my curiosity was quenched. I guess it was, you know, it'd be like um, seeing a duck billed platypus. I've never seen one. And once I see one, i will be like, okay, that's cool. And I wouldn't want to see another one. Um, no, because, I really kind of quit researching I, I, because I'm trying to write. I'm trying to become an author, you know, an established author. And um, I there. And plus, my first book, it was all Bigfoot. And, um, you know, in original printing, it was 500 pages. It's a massive book. Now, it reads really fast. It's funny. I'll have people get in touch with me, said they, they read it in two or three nights. But once I wrote that book, you know, I included everything I could. I could dig up about Sasquatch sightings and the phenomenon itself. You know, it has a uh, um, missing tracks, missing people, um, government cover-ups, uh, just anything you want. It, you know, it's all in this big, huge story. And I'd kind of used all my Bigfoot tricks. So I started looking into other phenomenon and combining them with the Sasquatch phenomenon. And I found it's, 
really, you know, I, I had another, I have another friend who's an author and he goes, man, I don't know how you tied that all together. He goes, I wouldn't have dreamed of, of the direction you went, but he goes, but it works. And I, and I said, well, yeah, but these things in my book, I do think they're all kind of tied together. Um, I don't know in what way I, I don't, you know, I don't know if it's a dimensional thing. I don't think they're an animal. Uh, I know a lot of people are adamant that they're an animal, but I think if it was straight up animal, and it's just my opinion, we would have one by now. We would have a carcass. We would have an example. We would have one in a cage somewhere. Um, so you'll, I just can't believe it's an animal. I think it's something more. I think it's partially spiritual. It may de be dimensional, but just from what I've seen of, of the phenomenon, the track and um, talking to people and out in the woods, I I think it's something more, Linda. I, I really do. Um, people are going to laugh. But um, sometimes I think people that uh, are convinced it's an ape, because when I first got into this, I just thought, OK, it's just an undiscovered ape. No big deal. But the more stories I've read and, and the encounters that go way back in the history with the First Nations people, um, I think it's got to be something else. I just think we would have one by now if it was an animal. And I think a lot of people... One reason I leaned so heavily on the ape um, explanation when I was first into this was the fact that that's the most explainable and, to me, the most acceptable. And I think a lot of people will never be budged from that because they think, well, I'm not one of those crazies. And if I insist it's an animal, people who are not into Bigfoot won't think I'm crazy. Well, I kind of got news for everybody. If you're into this subject, if you research it, believe in it, People who don't, they think you're crazy anyway, and it doesn't matter what your theory is. But I lean toward a more spiritual theory, a dimensional thing, and I kind of think all this ties together somehow, Linda. Well, that's what I'm hearing a lot from all the interviews that I've I've done. Um, I mean, there's still definitely a core, you know, flesh and blood uh, believers out there, but there's just too many unexplained experiences. Um, right. that you just can't you just can't throw that in um, away in trying to understand what what and if Bigfoot exists and and what it is that's that's a, still a huge question out there I think well if you have uh, wrapped it up I think this is a fantastic interview um I'm just I'm thrilled um you know when I I realized that you, your your book is a fictional book and I thought well you know I'm not sure and most of the the stuff I do is with you know hardcore researchers or uh, people who've had experiences. So I'm really glad you had your own personal experience because that adds a lot to it. Well, I was too, and, and you know, at first I I really didn't want to talk about any of this. You know, um, I've loosened up since got on podcasts. I'm not making any money off of Bigfoot. I mean, I make some a little money off my writing, but I'm not getting rich, and I have nothing to gain by by sharing experiences. You know, it's not going to help at all. Um, I really don't know anybody that's getting rich off Bigfoot or ever will. So, you know, if you're going to share your experiences, you know, you got to be willing to take your lumps, too. But I'm glad I had the experience. I wasn't for about the first year. I wasn't. I wish it hadn't happened because you want to tell people. And I just couldn't. And then finally, it was like getting, you know, pardon the pun. It was like getting a big monkey off my back because I just said, no. I'm going to share it. And once I started doing that, I felt better about it. Now I still have friends that, you know, probably, you know, think I'm nuts or you'll see them roll their eyes every now and then, but it's okay. It happened. My name is Cindy Cadell. I'm from Central Oregon. I was born in a small town outside Tucson, Arizona. Um, I grew up with uh, my stepfather who was raised not far from where the Patterson-Gimlin film was uh, captured. And so I kind of, I guess, was exposed to that um, around dinner table when I was a kid. He wasn't for sure if they were real, but he liked to talk to me about it, probably try to scare me, I guess. So that's kind of where my interest um, came from in, in Sasquatch. Um, I studied anthropology and sociology in college where we did a lot of research on um, primates and human origins. And so that kind of deepened my interest in the subject. Um, I have had something very strange happen in the Tillamook Forest years ago. 
Um, we had a thermal camera and we were, it was a very dark rainy night, very, very cold. And um, long story short, I was with Shane Corson of the Olympic project, which I'm also a part of. And we went out there because there had been some reports and I went to bed three different times, but Shane would come and knock on my, my car door. Well, it was my truck door because I was sleeping in a truck. And he's like, there's something out here. And finally, on the third time I went out, there was something out there and it looked like a large, um, I guess you would say human type figure with no clothes on behind a tree, kind of like peeking out and then going back and then peeking out again. Um, and then I actually yelled at it, hello, because I didn't know what I was looking at. And whatever it was moved extremely fast and it looked like it went probably to all fours on the ground and it moved so fast it startled me. And up to that point, I had not been um, nervous at all. And uh, that was interesting. And um, so I think that that may, may have been a Sasquatch if they exist. I still want to see one in full daylight <laughs> before I completely commit. Um, I've had a, a couple other different things that had happened with, um, I've made some recordings and sent them off to Dave Ellis at the Olympic project. And then um, also some other um, people that specialize in, in sounds and those sounds are not um, linked to any known animal. Um, so yeah, there's a couple things there. Well, let's go back well, to that, uh, that experience that you had in uh, the forest the night that it had been raining. Um, so you saw this creature uh, describe specifically, you know, kind of the, the, the movement, the atmosphere that was going on there as you saw this. It was, like I said, it was extremely cold. And even though I was born in Arizona, I consider myself an Oregonian. And it's kind of a joke that Oregonians just do not use umbrellas. And, and I don't use an umbrella. But that night, um, with all the rain, uh, and you couldn't see in like two feet in front of your face. It was pitch black raining and uh, very cold. And I had an umbrella over me just to kind of like paint the scene of how rainy it was. And um, it was, it looked like an oval, like the head looked kind of oval shape. Um, and it would just, there was a, a large, probably I think it was a fir tree um, and it would just kind of peek around it and then it would go back. And when it would go back, um, like the shoulders, I, what I'm assuming were the shoulders, you could see those. Um, and then when it go out, the shoulder would disappear. And then you would see like a head and another shoulder and whatever it was did not have clothes on. Cause after, um, we passed the camera off and I had yelled at it, it, we had lost sight of it. And Shane went out into the bushes, which were probably at least four feet high. And this was above all the bushes. Um, and I, I could tell Shane was a, a person, you know, he had clothes on. And so, um, with the heat signature, you could tell he was wearing clothes, whatever this was, didn't have clothes on. How did you respond to that? I mean, what, what did you just go back to sleep? I mean, what, what was your response? Um, we stayed up for a little while longer and used the fleur to like, look for it again. And it, we never saw it again. And I just went to bed and I don't think I fully processed it till the next day when we did a reenactment of what, where we were at and where we thought it had been standing. And it was about 60 meters away. And um, you could see where something had stood behind the tree and it was all scuffed up behind that tree. And then it started, <laughs> it started sinking in, like maybe this is what we saw. And it came, became a little bit more real. And, um, I think for at least several weeks, um, I would think about it often and it actually made me a little bit nervous to be out in the woods um, by myself. And I'm, I feel that I'm a little more cautious now. And I also work for the Forest Service, so I'm out in the woods a lot by myself. Um, and just, I mean, there's other predators you should worry about too, more so, um, like cougars or bear. 
Um, so I think that that experience just made me a little more cautious overall. Back and forth, back and forth, which is often uh, commented. Are there any other predators that tend to have that type of movement behavior? <laughs> Humans? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I can't imagine a bear doing that. And um, I mean, definitely not a cougar. I mean, it, whatever it was, was big. And um, like I said, there was the bushes um, that were at least four feet tall. So this was above that. So we think from a reenactment the next day that whatever this was, was about seven to seven and a half feet tall. Let's go on to the, the sounds. You've had those analyzed. Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah, so I sent them to Dave Ellis and then we sent him to somebody else who he doesn't want people to know who he is. I don't even know who he is, um, but he's an expert sound person and and they couldn't find anything in our known library of animals that make this sound. Um, so it was, you know, suspect and um, pretty interesting. And the night that I made those recordings was actually on a totally different night. I think it was probably two years before the sighting, but it was at the same location, which there had been a lot of reports coming out of from campers and, and such. But um, that night, we have recordings up and I have eight hours of recordings and I had made a call, you know, how people that research Bigfoot, they do what they think is the Bigfoot call. And I had done something like that and went back to camp. And then I could hear on the edge of my hearing something because we have a fire going and it's loud. And um, so I'm like, Oh, I hear something. And so I walked away from the camp and I could hear it sounded like two different animals or whatever on two different ridges calling back and forth. And that probably happened within <sighs> less than a minute of me making the call that I made. Um, and so that went on for a while. I think we have a couple um, minutes of recording of these two things going back and forth. And it was kind of, you know, kind of the, what you expect a Bigfoot would sound like, like the howling. Um, and there was also kind of some weird little it almost sounded like jabbering mixed in that. It was very odd. And, um, but that whole night we had the recorders going and something um, at one point in the middle of the night went running up to my recorder, which had like a, a red light on it. And it ran up to it and it sounded like it was like shuffling around the recorder. And when I had sent it to Dave Ellis of the Olympic Project, I didn't tell him anything about the night. I just sent him the recording. And um, he's like, oh, it sounds like you had something run up on your recorder. And this was this recorder was up on top of, I don't want to say what it was up on top of because it'll kind of give away where, where were we at, but it was up on something very high. And um, whatever would have seen that up there and tried to go look a little closer to it must have been pretty tall. You've been part of BFRO for a long time and do expeditions with them. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, I did one last year. I'm not sure because of my schedule if I can do one this year, but um, it's something I do for fun. And uh, it's nice to just go out in the woods and if nothing else, go hiking and at the, um, these expeditions, we do a lot of other things. We have classes. Um, sometimes I have a police officer come in and he does tracking classes or fingerprint lifting classes if there was ever any evidence how to collect it. Um, we do cast tracking, uh, cast, um, casting classes, sorry. Um, so if you did find a, a print of, I mean, even something like a cougar print would be pretty interesting. We teach them how to do some casting. Um, and we do other classes too. Sometimes I give a class on um, human origins and we talk about primate behavior and we do nature hikes and photography. So it's not just um, Bigfoot that we're out there talking about or looking for. It's just a good time to go out and explore nature. What do you think um, Bigfoot is? I, I don't know exactly. Um, if we got some undisputable DNA, I think that would help us a little bit better where to place it on the, on the primate tree. I think that Gigantopithecus is often referred to, but I don't, I'm not sure if that's what it is. 
I think it's an easy model to fall back on and it's a great model to have because we do have that fossil evidence, but I think it might be something else. Um, I mean, the human tree is, family tree is like a bush. It's not really like a tree that goes straight up. So I think we are related to it somehow. How far back that is, I have no idea. Do you lean more toward it just being a flesh and blood creature? Yes. Okay. I do. So what in um, in all of your um, exploring, researching, have you had any reports that were just uh, really fascinating and interesting? Absolutely. The one that stands out the most is um, I went in for a checkup and my doctor, um, she delivered my, my grandkids um, with my daughter, Megan, and she knew Megan and I were interested in Bigfoot and we would do expeditions sometimes. And so I went in for a checkup and she's like, Hey, you and Megan are, are into Bigfoot, right? I said, yeah, we have an interest in that. And she's like, you know, I think there might be something to that because of all the native oral traditions. And I'm like, yeah, there could be something to that. And we kind of left it at that. And I think it was about seven months later, I went back in for a follow-up exam and um, she brought it up again. She's like, you and Megan are into Bigfoot. I'm like, yes. And I don't know if she forgot she had talked to me about it. Well, I'm not sure. But she's like, yeah, I think there's something to that. She's like, my husband told me not to tell anybody this because they'll think we're crazy. But they had, um, they lived in Portland area, Portland, Oregon area, and went up into the Washington Ho rainforest and were hiking. And her pager went off to um, go back to Portland to deliver a baby. And so she said, she's like, oh gosh, you know, she was frustrated, obviously. And because she had to drive back to Portland, they had literally just got there. And so they turn around to walk down this trail that they had just walked up. And she said, said one walked in front of them across the trail. And she said the thing that stood out the most was the top of its head was like the sunlight was dabbling through the trees and just it was kind of lit up. And it was, she said it was her, its hair was red in the sunlight. And um, I think for her to come to me and trust me with that information um, says a lot. And especially how cautious she was before she talked to me about it. It, you know, it's, it's reports like that that make me like, there might be something to this. And so it keeps, it piques my interest and keeps my interest. It was just a, a brief sighting of crossing the road or just right there? Right. At the stepped out of the forest and crossed the road and then back into the forest. And she thought that maybe she, they had like, um, like it didn't expect them to turn around and go back. So they were, it was using that time to cross. So, and there is a lot of sightings up there. That's actually where the Olympic, near where the Olympic project has their headquarters and their research location. Um, and there's a lot of crossings on the uh, the road in that area and near Forks, um, Washington. And so I just think that's pretty interesting. One that stands out to me is there was a, a man and his child, and I think his child um, maybe had um, was on the spectrum and had uh, a mild case of autism. And they were fishing at a lake out near Mount Hood. Um, I can't remember the name of the lake right now. It, I can't remember. But they were fishing. And then the father's like, hey, I'm going to go down there. They saw like an abandoned raft. And so he's like, I'm going to go get that and bring it back. And so the father walked down there, left his son there fishing. Um, he And it was kind of like, I guess, around a corner where the father couldn't see everything in the woods behind the son. But he gets to the raft and he's yelling at his son to come over so that they could go take it out. And his son was just looking behind him and wouldn't come to him or acknowledge him. And so he was getting frustrated with his son and he walked back and said, what's going on? Why didn't you come when I called you? And the little boy had caught a fish and it was flopping around on the ground. And he said that there was like, I don't remember his exact words, but like a, a large ape or monkey behind him in the woods watching. And the little boy said that the what they thought was a Bigfoot was watching the fish that he had just caught. And the little boy had the feeling that it wanted the fish. And the little boy 
ended up throwing a stick at it and then running towards his father as his father was coming towards him. Um, the father didn't see anything, but um, it was that was really interesting. Um, I used to um, help Finding Bigfoot line up witnesses, and that was one of the witnesses that they wanted on the show. And then the little boy, he was like, I already told him the story. Why should I, like, tell it again? Which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, but, yeah. Most of the reports, I mean, they're just totally unexpected moments in people's lives where they just see something. Right, right. Um, there was another story, I guess it was in the 80s. Um, my stepdad worked at a place in Bend, and he said one of his coworkers came in and uh, was really upset and told him that he had been hunting outside Sisters, Oregon, and he saw what he said looked like an upright huge ape running through the forest and away from him and he was really upset and and so my my dad trusted this person and he ended up my father ended up going up there the next weekend and went to the area that this guy had said he saw running through the forest and he actually found some footprints in the like a sandy area that it had ran through um so i thought that was pretty interesting too and that's, you know, being a kid, that was pretty interesting to hear that. That was so close to us because we lived outside Bend um, near Sisters. So that also helped shape my interest, too. Did your father ever see a Bigfoot? Did you say No, that? he saw those prints um, after he went up to that same area, but I, I don't think he's ever seen anything. Um, although I think... <laughs> I kind of forgot about this till just now. Um, he had been camping in just a sleeping bag. I think it was in the seventies and it was somewhere in Oregon. I don't remember where, um, I think he might've been hunting, but, um, he was in a sleeping bag on the ground, didn't have a tent. And he said something came up and poked him and sounded like, felt like a finger. And then when he got out of his sleeping bag, cause he was all covered up, there was like nothing around him. Um, but he didn't tell me that that would have happened in the seventies sometime. And he actually didn't tell me, my mom told me like about two or three years ago. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me this? <laughs> but I mean, obviously he didn't see what it did it, but it was just, it was kind of an interesting story. I've heard that a lot. There's, you know, someone's in a tent and they'll obviously since that, you know, there's a hand that's pushed on the tent or kind of, right. kind of nudges someone they're really close by but um people don't usually see them they just feel that so right. do you have a lot of reports on that um i mean i have i had a few i had a friend who was in a tent and they weren't interested in bigfoot until this moment but um something was i think it pushed on the tent and or pulled on the string like it, it was like I think it was one of those tents that you put a rope up and you throw it over the rope um and it was pulling on the rope and I think making noises and walking around and, and throwing rocks at the tent so I mean I've had stuff like that told to me in your experience the reports that you've heard about the things you've read about what about the danger from these things do you think they're dangerous or pretty much not well, I always say I wouldn't let them babysit my kids or my grandkids. <laughs> I think they're like anything, any animal or any human that you, they could be unpredictable. I mean, we don't, we don't know what their culture is. We don't know what, what they do. Um, it's not like we're Jane Goodall and we can go out and study them. Um, Cause we're, we can't just sit there and watch them all day. It's just good luck finding one. Um, I, I think that, they should be treated with respect and caution. I've heard of a few cases where you know people really did get hit by a rock or something that was thrown uh, that they felt like you know was intentional, maybe so maybe not so right. Some of them, right? I mean, and I've heard a lot of stories about them throwing rocks, but they always are like really close to them. They don't really usually hit them, you know. So I think that that's interesting and. Um, I was, I studied psychology in college too. That's what my major was at first. And I changed my major um, my senior year after um, a lot of the <clears throat> studies I had read about like primates, but 
there was one thing I had read and I don't remember if it's the left side of the brain or the right side of the brain. I don't, I haven't thought about this for a long time, but one side, the side that speech um, develops in is also the side where like you can, it helps you to take aim if you were throwing a rock. And I'm not wording that very well. And I'm kind of embarrassed by how I just worded that. But it's um, basically the same side of the brain where if you were going to throw a rock and you were pretty accurate, that's the same side that the speech develops in. So I thought that was kind of interesting um, because they say that they have language of, you know, of some sort. Um, and then they throw rocks and they're supposedly really accurate. So... I think that there might be something to that. What do you think about the Sierra sounds? Right, right. Um, well, I know Ron. Um, he's a great guy. And I believe that he did capture those. And I think that there's something there. And I, I know that the studies they've done on it, um, the human vocal cords cannot reproduce that. So that's another um, pretty interesting tidbit as far as Bigfoot goes to lean towards, yeah, there are real species. And some of the the um, inflictions in some of those sounds are pretty distinct and, and very um, unusual uh, you know, as far right. as the animals go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if your listeners have not listened to the Sierra sounds before, I highly recommend listening to them. Okay. If someone were going to start uh, researching Bigfoot, what would you recommend for them? I would say just go camp. <laughs> go camp, hike around. Um, I know a lot of people try to go and try to find them, but I think if they were in the area and if you're making noise and just being crazy humans like we are, they're going to come over and watch. I mean, that's like the best television for them, right? <laughs> um, so I would say just go camp, pay attention to your surroundings, um, go on hikes, look for, you know, footprints or any kind of evidence. Um, I look being out in the woods all the time. I'm always looking for footprints. And um, I mean, I find like cougar and bear track and bobcat, um, not a whole lot else, but <laughs> I'm always looking. So any certain area of the country that you would recommend that um, someone look in or that you think the population is higher? There is a lot of reports in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I think that would be a great place to to look and research. Um, that's where I live too. So I might be a little biased, but um, there is a lot of reports out of Ohio. So um, you can go on the BFRO website and, and they have everything listed out there. I mean, a lot of the reports honestly do not get in there because it's a process to interview them. And sometimes people don't even want their story published in the BFRO um, report um, section. But I would look there and just see what you can find. If there's a state or area close to you, I would start there. More reports now? And if so, why? I think the internet has made it really easy to connect with other people and share stories. So, and I think maybe people are out in the woods more and they're seeing more things. So I think it's a little bit of a combination. Um, I know that there would have been sightings, you know, 100, 200 years ago, 1,000 years ago, I don't know. Um, there's Native American oral tradition um, that supports that. So I think there have been sightings. It's just we have, it's easier to access information now. On the Native American traditions, what can you share about that? Because I'm really curious about that. Uh, that knowledge, perhaps, of these um, these Bigfoot, Sasquatch, whatever you want to call them. Um, I mean, I'm really curious about their knowledge of that. Right. Um, well, you'll hear a lot of their oral traditions, like they're kind of cautionary tales, like stay away from them, don't mess with them, they'll steal your children, they eat people. <laughs> I mean, in a lot of ways, um, they're, they're kind of horrifying some of the stories. Um, so I think that the Native Americans, they were seeing them and they just had a, a natural respect for them. Um, so I think that that was really kind of their focus, like leave them, leave them be. That's or they had also some areas that they were saying that's their area. We don't go there. Um, so, 
Yeah, I'm not sure if I really answered your question, but yeah, I think that a lot of the times it was, you know, they were very cautious and respectful of them. Um, there was also other stories saying that they were here first and then we came along. So I think uh, right. different right. tribes have a little bit different version. So what do you think about the, the idea that uh, so many people that go missing, like a national forest and such, that, that Bigfoot has anything to do with that? Yeah, the Missing 411 series. Yeah. Um, I think that that's pretty interesting. Um, and, I mean, some people could have fallen in rivers. I mean, we don't we don't really know. But it is a little bit, it is a little bit scary. Um, I think one of the reports in, oh gosh, I don't, he has, um, David Pilates has several different books, and I don't remember which book it was in, but there was um, an account that a family was hiking, they met another family, and there was like an open area, and everybody was playing, the kids were playing, and one of the little boys went to hide, and then he just disappeared, and I'm hoping I'm not getting my stories mixed up, but I don't think I am, but so the family, they realize he's missing, they're looking everywhere for him, he's gone, and I think it was several miles away at a campground. Um, there was a report of people seeing something large carrying what looked like a small child, like um, darting between trees. Um, and that was, you know, several miles away from where the child went missing. So that's a bit concerning. And that right there would, you know, would fall right in line with some of the Native American oral traditions on them stealing children. Um, so I would be cautious out in the woods for not just like because of this, but just in general, it's kind of a dangerous area, especially for children, um, because you do have large predators, um, cougars, bears. I mean, yeah. What do we need to know as amateur Bigfoot interest did people out here? I think that they're related to human humans in some form. Um, I think that there's not very many of them. Um, I think that you should treat them with respect if they're real. Like I said, I want to see one in full daylight before I completely commit to it. It's hard to commit to something like that you haven't confirmed that you've seen. Um, but I would just say if you're out there looking for them, just be cautious, always be uh, prepared um, just in general um, and just go have fun, look for evidence, look for footprints, um, take a camera. If you do see something, um, videotape it rather than take pictures because at least with video, you're getting hundreds and hundreds of still images in a sense and you can, um, see their movements. Um, so I think video would be the way to go. Um, what else What else would you like to know? I, don't, I think I kind of went off on that. So just anything, anything and everything that, uh, that you think would be of interest. Yeah, I, like I said, I, I, I think that there's something to the story, especially because of the th people I've talked to, for instance, my doctor. Um, I think it's something that's very rare. And if you do see something, I mean, that is very rare and should be, I guess you could say cherished, although it could make you very nervous to go into the woods. Um, yeah, I just have an open mind. Um, uh, people like to make fun of people who believe in the subject or have an interest in the subject. And a lot of times they don't, they won't talk to people because they saw something and they don't want to be made fun of. So just have an open mind. Maybe someday we'll have some kind of an evidence that would support it. Um, but yeah, I think that they're rare. And I think that they could be a just an animal that's somewhere on the primate non-human tree. What is the most likely piece of evidence that may prove these things? Well, they've They've gone over the Patterson Gimlin film and a lot of people are like it's fake. Okay. So I look at that film and it looks organic to me. Um, it was filmed in, I think 1967 and that's back when, you know, planet of the apes was being filmed. I mean, if you look at the costumes in planet of the apes compared to the Patterson Gimlin film, there's no comparison. And I know I can't, I, I can't think of his name right now, 
but he was like, oh, that was me in a, a, a gorilla suit. It's like, well, you never produced the gorilla suit. Let's see it. You know, that's not something, if you put that much effort into creating this suit, why would you not keep it? Um, so I think the Patterson Gimlin film is our best evidence. And um, I mean, they see muscle tone in there. I mean, the way it walks, um, it can't be duplicated by a man in a suit. And like I said, let's just go back to Planet of the Apes. I mean, you could tell that that was somebody in a costume. What type of DNA do you think would be our, the best uh, piece of evidence to actually be able to get some results? Well, I mean, there has been DNA that's been submitted that was supposedly Bigfoot DNA, but it always comes back like it seems to always come back unless I'm misinformed as human. Maybe they're closely related to humans that it throws everything off. I don't know. I'm not an expert on that. I, I can't really speak to that. Um, I think the best evidence is going to have to be a body, um, whether it's found or I know people want to shoot them, which I don't agree with that, but it definitely would, you know, solidify that they're a real creature, but I don't, I hope that nobody does that. Um, but yeah, body, a body would be great or even bones. And um, it's pretty interesting. We know bear are out there and I've only seen one dead bear in all the thousands of miles that I've hiked in the woods. Um, and the only bear I've seen was hit on I-5 up in Washington, um, the only dead bear. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting too, if there's not very many of these and if they're intelligent, maybe they go somewhere to die or I don't know when I'm sick, I go to bed. Um, when bears are sick, they go and hide somewhere. Um, there was a bear biologist that, you know, he's seen a lot of bears, but they were always alive. And the only time he found a dead bear in his research was he saw a paw sticking out from a, a log and this bear had crawled under a log or in a log to, um, it was sick and it, it passed away in there. So, um, I mean, we, there's just, there's so many unknowns, but the forest, especially in the Pacific Northwest is huge. Um, bodies don't last very long. They get um, eaten by predators and worms and bugs and birds. So, you know, it'd be, I think it'd be really, really hard to find a body. So it's kind of difficult to to really get like that substantial truth. And like you said, it would be it would be helpful for yourself to just see something at least. Right. Um, where where you have that where you, you can trust your perceptions and and be able to to actually know that it's there. Um, right. what do you make of I mean, I interview people, not that many, because I don't have that many pieces of film out there, but I interview a lot of people and and it does seem like there are several sightings that are reports that are coming in. Um, what do you make of, of, you know, the secondhand information, I guess you, you didn't see it, but what do you, um, give credit to as far as other people's sightings? I like to interview them and just kind of watch their body language. And, um, you can tell when somebody's sincere about what they're saying. Um, so I think it's really important to meet with people, talk with them, um, at the Forest Service, I was talking to one of our firefighters, and I haven't told anybody his name, <clears throat> but he told me that after a fire, I think he was doing some cleanup, and it was outside Sisters, which I mentioned before with that one sighting. Um, he saw one running beat from tree to tree and hiding from him, and I don't think he shared that with very many people. Um, so I think sometimes when they don't really share with anybody, um, I think that gives us a lot of credibility and I know this person and he's an honest person and I know that he saw something. Um, so yeah, just talking to them, getting to know what they're like says a lot. Um, and it can, it can lead you down the path of believing what they say. The people who tend to have kind of um, 
traumatic experiences and and the aftermath of that with them you know there are several people i talked to and it, this literally is life-changing when they see something that they don't believe it even exists and then right. they have this unreal kind of experience and it's also it can be a very frightening experience at times um where they're you know they're more vulnerable like night fishing or, or hunting or just hiking through the woods and see something that is a bit intimidating to them what do you think about the aftermath of that psychologically for people um i think that yeah like you said it would be life-changing um i know with what i saw which which you know, it was just on a flare and you didn't see any details. Um, I know what it could have been. So, but I can't commit to that's really what it was. It just kind of fits like what we think of Bigfoot should be. Um, it changed how I felt in the woods and I'm extremely cautious and always aware. Um, I don't walk around in the woods by myself at night. Um, that's just not going to happen. And, and I used to, um, like to just walk away from the camp, to use the restroom or whatever. Um, it kind of changed my thinking about being safe in the woods. And that was just seeing something on FLIR. I can't imagine these people that see it, you know, in full daylight and they know what they're looking at. Um, I, yeah, I can imagine that would be very scary and probably in a lot of cases, stop people from doing whatever activity they were doing before. Yeah, um, for some of them, it it, it truly um, became a, a nightmarish kind of situation to, to have to process something that you don't expect to exist. Right, yeah. right. You're always told, you know, these don't exist, you know, it's just, you know, fables or stories. Um, but for the people that, do see them and know what they've seen. Um, that's got to be extremely life changing. Someone does see um, see one of these things. Sometimes that does create a bit of a um, an obsession to see another one, to go back and go back and go back. What do you think of that? I think that's very real, <clears throat> and I think it happens a lot. Probably more so than the the people that see something and they're like, Oh, I'm not going out in the woods ever again. Um, I think it causes people to research the subject, maybe reach out to other people that are interested and um, possibly make some kind of a community where maybe they feel safe going out with like other people that have seen something and sharing their stories with them. And um, I think once you get into that, it's kind of a, a weird little subculture, the Bigfoot community. Um, <clears throat> and there's a lot of tight friendships in there. And uh, a lot of the people know each other. And so I think that that could propel them into researching more on Sasquatch. Whereas if they didn't have that community to fall back on, they would just like, oh, I had this weird experience. And they tell their friends and family and they all laugh at them. And then they never do anything with it. But once exactly. again, <laughs> has helped people make those connections. Exactly. What and another thing that I've noticed just from all the comments on the videos I do put out, um, it's validation too that you know that what they saw um, was more potentially very real. Right. Yeah, that's true. Definitely looking for validation too, which I think everyone is. You know, when you have a reality that you know that you saw, I think you know having some evidence of this would be wonderful because they want to believe that this thing is real and have that believed by others as well. Right. Right. Well, what else can you tell me? Um, you know, anything else that, that, uh, that you can think of? Huh. I mean, we could probably end up talking for hours and hours. outdoors, be safe, you know, take a camera, take a video camera. I mean, all of our phones can video anymore. And, you know, if you hear something or see something, try to get it on video. Exactly. And, and the minute you do, share it. <laughs> right. So. I'll lend you everybody. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'll get it out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is pretty interesting. And it's fun. Even if they're not real, it's fun to think about. And um, yeah, it's it's just fun.